This is the story of Robert of Maine, a figure who arrives to our history books battered and beaten by the swirling tides of the medieval world, but arrives nonetheless. Robert was the eldest son of a gung-ho French duke named William. In 1064, this duke, in his quest to dominate his domestic rivals around his Duchy of Normandy, seized control of the county of Maine, part of the neighbouring Duchy of Anjou. He gave this tenuous new territory to ten-year-old Robert, elevating him to the rank of count and granting him a personal barony in the area. The ambitious duke surely wished to start his boy off on the right foot with such a generous province, but for Robert, it seemed more like a consolation prize. William had risen to the rank of duke by age eight, so to be a count at ten was just one more episode in a series of ongoing confirmations that he was destined to live in the shadow of his controversial yet brilliant father. Since a ten-year-old count was ultimately of no use to anyone, Robert's bookish tutor, Orderic, was named Count Regent. Between them, they were required to carry out a simple mission – keep the neighbouring Duke of Anjou, Gregory, out of Norman affairs. Why worry about a frankly petty duke with a mere tenth the wealth in men or coin of the burgeoning Duchy of Normandy? Because of what William would do two years later. The men and monies were loaded up for a grand military campaign across the Channel into England. William may have been a duke, but his luck was better still, for ten years prior, amid the political turbulence that constantly battered their northern neighbour, he had been named as heir to the Kingdom of England. Kings and courtiers continued to come and go, but William hung on to that old promise, and what's more, the Pope himself agreed to proclaim its legitimacy. So in September 1066, he invaded England in search for the throne he was promised, and the throne that would be Robert's too, if all went well. All Robert needed to do was wait for his father's success to trickle down to him. From his perspective, it was the perfect arrangement. His fortune to be born to such a productive father left him the leeway to take it easy. From baron to count to duke if not king, his rise to power was destined to be automatic. That is not to say there was nothing at all Robert wished to achieve at the tender age of twelve when his father disappeared off to war. For starters, he was tired of being told when to go to bed, or being told when, where and how to do just about everything. It was time to challenge the rule of Regent Orderic. While it was unusual for a ward to renounce their guardian, in this case it was indeed true that Orderic's power came only from the trust placed in him by House Normandy, and with William far from reach, Robert's elevated lisping voice could ring out in court with far more authority than his hairless face might lead one to imagine possible. In fact, he began rearranging the whole of Maine's ruling council, much to the delight of many. A hand-picked group of courtiers was assembled before the young Count, who clearly had been planning something for just the moment when his father was indisposed. He had devised a plan to end the amorous stare that his neighbour Gregory had for his county. He would take the Duchy of Anjou by force. It was an impossible task, in reality, obvious to any more than a few years older than the Count, or to anyone whose father had not spent his whole life making such power plays look easy. Work began on forging the letters required to imply that House Normandy had been granted certain territories by the King. Some courtiers appealed to Robert's mother and de facto ruler of Normandy in William's absence, Matilda, to intervene, but she took quite the opposite stance. Trusting Robert to have absorbed something of his father's legacy, she looked on eagerly to witness her layabout son finally showing some ambition. In England, William's progress had been substantial. The ruler, King Harold, had found himself invaded by both the Normans and the Norwegians at the same time, and had little hope to hold out against both. William quickly secured the politically vital county of Middlesex from where domination of southern England could truly begin. 
At home, news of these victories was received rather cynically, for matters in Normandy and France as a whole were beginning to match those experienced by the floundering English. An English army had sailed to Normandy to beat William at his own game, and marched unchallenged into the defenceless duchy. A bigger army still from the Holy Roman Empire was conquering its way towards Paris, again with no sign that any mustering of troops would suffice to stop them. So for poor Robert, his quiet life in the temperate lands he commanded was to be forcibly interrupted by the responsibilities of a medieval vassal. He was honour bound to protect the lands held by his father by challenging the English aggression. He was honour bound to protect the lands of his liege, King Philip of France, by rallying to the defence of Paris against the invading Germans. But alas, he was honour bound, he insisted, to finish learning how to write the hilarious curses used by the peasantry, and to sleep as and when the good Lord God gave him the desire to. That is not to criticise his carelessness, for it was, technically, the responsibility of his regent, now an absent-minded mayor named Oddo, to attend to these stately matters. Oddo was no William. There was little he could do with the county's 600 or so troops to aid his lieges high and low. For the good of all, then, he passed the warm summer of 1067 reading on the balcony of the castle at Le Mans, listening with the occasional smirk to Robert's regular raging rants to Orderic on topics such as God's likelihood to take offence at errors in handwriting. Perhaps the spirits of the men and beasts who laboured and died at castles not so far away were able to conspire to punish Otto, for soon his summer of unearned content was to end. The episode began innocently enough. Robert, like most boys of his age, found a certain pleasure in practising his hand at sword fighting. For the son of a famous military commander, it would have been outrageous were he not found gallivanting around the castle with wooden practice weapons at any hour of the day. One day, he was emulating his father directly, charging through the estate and imagining a body of loyal riders at his back. He came upon the breezy hall that acted as the antechamber to the grand balcony on which Oddo resided. The regent stood, leaning down over the edge, peering at some going on in the gardens. It was time for the true ruler of Maine to once again reclaim his title from a self-righteous regent. Robert charged with all his might, his sword dangling amateurishly in his hand, his wooden horse levelled forwards at his target. Otto was found in a bed of roses some hours later by a kitchen maid, who saw fit to alert the whole county to the incident with her screams. Orderic, suspecting foul play, insisted that a man of God whom even Robert would not dare trifle with be appointed regent. Robert was delighted with the suggestion. The Bishop of Evron, the eventual choice, was far too busy to attend to daily matters of the court so Robert was now rather free to act as he pleased. Considering that his only goal had been to attain this freedom, this, in essence, meant nothing at all for anyone else. This hard-won victory at home would then be shattered by news from abroad. Just days later, important news of state was placed into Robert's hands. A message from the king, who was roughly Robert's age as well, it is worth noting, stating that Normandy's war against England was to end in light of a special arrangement between the royal houses Capet and Godwin. The situation in Paris had become so dire that the French king had appealed to England to fight the Germans in exchange for truce and alliance. It was a deal that benefited England in that the Normans would be forced to withdraw, benefited the Norwegians in that now only they were pressing a claim to English sovereignty, and benefited King Philip in that his kingdom's prospects would improve, and, a cynic may argue, it prevented his vassal William from rising above his station with his ploy to become a potential rival king. Someone had to be the loser here, and Robert was certain that it was him. If his father was not allowed to win him a kingdom, how was he to acquire it? England was to be his birthright, and now he was suddenly restricted to dreaming of becoming a mere duke. 
Who was to blame, his liege or the Germans? Perhaps both. As things stood, he was only allowed to kill one of these parties, so that would have to suffice. He ordered the levies to be raised from his personal estates, and had them march east to join his father beneath not the banner of Normandy, but of France itself. They marched for Paris, and then for the camp of William at montfort la marie William was overjoyed to learn of Robert's orders, for while he had a slight edge against the nearby Germans, Robert's men turned that into a definitive edge. The French army attacked, with Robert's men as part of the right flank, and with one of Robert's own retainers, Centoul, leading the wing. If his random series of hand gestures and insistences that the enemy should be killed can be called leading. William's trusted general Oddo, Robert's uncle and no relation to the recently gravitationally challenged man of the same name, led the centre. Thanks to the reinforcements, he was able to push an overwhelming force into the German lines, breaking their centre and seizing the momentum. Centoul led his men to a stalemate and ultimately a mutual retreat on the right flank, but as he retreated, he encountered the product of the King's deal with England. A fresh English army rushed into the fray on the French side, uniting with the routing units to turn on the Germans and run them off the field completely, ending their domination over the countryside around Paris. It was by no means the end of the fighting, but it was a symbolic victory for the French, and for young Robert, whom William was quick to credit. Said Duke, working now with his sworn enemy, carried the war back to the northeast, leaving Robert's men the task of clearing up a raiding party rumoured to be hiding in the county of Seine. The job was done, and the men of Maine returned home. 200 head fewer than when they had left, but victorious, and bathed in far more fame than their service, good as it was, warranted. People were quick to insist that William's military legacy was now manifesting in Robert. The boy who struggled to hit a practice dummy with the sharp bit of a sword, and spent his days cursing the world for not making him a king already. Who was to be King of England after all this? No Frenchman, nor any Englishman. With the Normans placated, the Norwegians had been free to conquer as they pleased, and at the beginning of July 1068, news arrived that King Harald IV of Norway had taken the English throne. Robert was aghast. The work his father would have to do for him had doubled, for now his enemy was a man with two kingdoms, not just one. It was obvious that the selfish King of France was to blame. While across the land the nobles were praising the young king's humility and wisdom in employing the English to uphold French prestige, Robert was dreaming of all the ways he could punish his treacherous liege. A lifetime of scheming truly began. He would become king of something, one way or another. Disaster had struck for young Robert of Maine. His father, William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, was robbed of his chance to conquer England by the selfish King of France. King Philip had made William fight to resist a minor German territorial claim in the Low Countries, allowing a Norwegian army to usurp the power of House Godwin. The war for Zealand killed enough of William's weary troops that the campaign for the majesty of House Normandy had to cease indefinitely. The crown that Robert was to be heir to had been snatched away and dragged into the swampy fog of Britannia. His easy life as a teenage count suddenly received a very clear focus. A crown was to sit on his head, and of those who could grant him his right, only one man remained, or one boy perhaps it should be said, the dastard King Philip. Robert needed to convince the French royal court that Normandy's claim to England was a concern of theirs. Only with the support of the bickering high nobles of Francia and Aquitania could he rally enough troops to claim a country full of veteran warriors like England. Therefore, Robert began his act. He was to be the most loyal and dedicated scion of House Capet, the French royal dynasty, so that they might be slowly fooled and folded into the hands of House Normandy. He began right away. 
he sent 600 troops with his compliments for the king to Paris. The king was not there, for the city was currently enduring a brief tyranny under a gang of German troops left over from the battle at montfort la -Marie. Robert's bumbling man Centul decided to lay siege to the whole city to avoid a fight with the paltry force. The Germans surrendered eventually, but the suffering caused to the city by the blockade was unlikely to sit well with Robert's would-be patrons. He had to achieve more then. Centul took the men of Maine on a long march to the front lines of the war, Zealand. Robert had devised a plan to give the knights and nobles of the French army a lasting impression of his great destiny. Centoul had been given a forged letter from the king, instructing the French armies to follow him into battle as quickly as possible. It was suitably convincing. The French army stormed the German keeps of Zealand and reclaimed the territory within days of Centoul's arrival. The same could be said for other nearby forts and towns held by German garrisons. It seemed that wherever the Banner of Maine went, wherever men loyal to House Normandy went, victory quickly followed. At the same time, Robert had personally promised King Philip that Maine would deliver him from the war that so unsettled him, and that France's safety would be his foremost concern, not like his overly ambitious father. So it was that when the letter ruse was revealed to Philip, he saw it only as a genius ploy to rally the French troops. With Duke William away in England trying to extract the remains of his fettered invasion force, Robert was solely to receive the credit for the work of the Norman troops. And they were being put to work, no doubt about it. They participated in a small counter-invasion of the Holy Roman Empire, and then marched to Zealand to join the charge against a German army. The ensuing struggle was to be the decisive battle of the war. Days of brutal fighting in sharp winter air bloodied the ground in which the Banner of Maine had been placed. At home, though, times were far happier. Below colourful windows and before dancing flames, a feast was held on the 1st of January 1070, celebrating Robert's 16th birthday. Among the many gifts he received was the right to rule, to claim his county as his own. The time of regents and wooden horses was over. He quickly set out from the warmth of Le Mans, riding for the war in which victory must be inseparably married to his heroic image. He met his troops on the road, marching home after their victory in Zealand. Robert halted them with his retinue, and shouted with fury untempered by the rushing of cold drizzle in the strong wind. He reminded his men that the war was not over, and that the king himself had personally commanded each and every one of them to return victorious. Some of them thought that this was what they were doing. Robert screamed at these men with a wet, lisping rasp, denouncing their selfish cowardice. How could they walk away from his duty? They were convinced, so to speak, and joined him for a march to get his face familiar in the camp of the main French army in Hainaut. In May, he and his army moved to Zealand again to fight an echo of last winter's battle. It was his first time seeing the action he had heard so much about in person. He was enthusiastic to get stuck in, but in truth knew little of military matters aside from his tried and tested theory that riding a horse into someone was a good way of getting things done. Fortunately, little skill was needed on the day of the battle. Robert's grumbling troops had arrived late, and once he was done trying to make his formation look neat and tidy for their advance down the right flank, the German troops had been routed by the earlier wave of attacks. It was perfect in many ways. His debatably fresh troops poured across the open flank of the enemy and surrounded their centre, in which the Holy Roman Emperor himself fought. All would see that it was Robert's attack that turned the table of the battle, as awkwardly conducted as it was. Of those who saw it, none were more elated than his father, William, who was leading the French left flank by popular demand, and who had been tasked with doing just what Robert had suddenly achieved out of nowhere. 
Robert's undeserved reputation as the true inheritor of William's prowess was now all but set in stone. The best thing to do now was to ensure that word of his achievements reached King Philip before anyone else attempted to say anything differently. Philip was of course delighted to hear that Robert was going to such great effort to further the French cause, especially considering that Normans were not wholly considered to even be French on account of their Viking ancestry. The plan had worked. Robert could return home, comfortably written into the history of his nation and fondly remembered by the royal court. Two hundred men of his county had died to give him this gift, but Robert paid that no thought, precisely the amount that the lives of serfs deserved. The next year, his levied army, bigger and better trained on account of his court-martial's drilling of peasantry, marched out again to rejoin the dragging Zealand War. The invasion of Germany was continuing, and would continue continuing until the Emperor admitted that Zealand belonged to France. Little fighting was actually taking place, so in many ways it was a nice excuse to improve Robert's PR with a pleasant march through the summery countryside and to see the sights and delights of life along the River Saone. Amid such peaceful warfare, Robert turned his attention to matters as important to the medieval nobility as any crusade – marriage. He had already been in communication with the King of Sweden in that regard, and after his partially imagined war glory had been suitably conveyed, he had secured a betrothal with his daughter, Mare. For a mere count to marry into a royal family was widely seen as a mark of a certain greatness in character and destiny that was rarely seen. The betrothal alone marked Robert as a noble of the highest order, perhaps competing already with his own father. William had married a king's granddaughter. Now Robert had landed himself one step closer to a crown. It would be a decade and more before Mare was of the age for marriage, but in the meantime, other matrimonial ploys could be conducted. Robert's motivations to become a great man were matched equally by motivations to ensure that his rivals cast no shadows. No greater rival could an heir of a landed noble have than his own sibling, a male sibling of almost the same age even more so, and that was what Richard of Normandy was. It was almost inevitable that Robert would be battling Richard, his third brother William, and even his sisters for his entire life. He was keen then to strike the first blow himself. He wanted to ensure that Richard did not secure a marriage with even a hint of the prestige that his own princess bride generated. He wrote to Duke William, informing him that in the court of Maine there was a young woman who pined for a husband, and who had an adoration for Norman life despite her own Frankish ethnicity. Robert requested formally that she be allowed to marry Richard as a sign of union between House Normandy and the neighbouring Duchy of Flanders, to which young Adelaide was tangentially related. The Duke, eager to grant the wish of the son he saw a hero in his own image, agreed at once. Richard was to marry a woman with no chance of inheriting anything, with no titles, and thanks to her, in truth, being Richard's own cousin, with a reduced chance of creating worthwhile heirs in the decades to come. The war ended at around this time, and everyone returned home, but Robert's victory over his brother far outshone the anguish of some foreign emperor. That winter, the troops marched home to Maine, but to their dismay, they stumbled into a war. Their disappointment was Robert's delight. His father had decided to declare war on the jealous Duchy of Anjou, on account of the fact that Duke Geoffrey the Ill Ruler had tried his hand at redirecting church tithes to his own estates and had become excommunicated as a result. An excommunicated man had no right to complain when a loyal Christian coveted his lands. And so, the many favours of Duke William now included this war, into which Robert and company plunged. Their advantage was absolute, and victory was certain, so it provided a suitable chance for a bit of bonding between father and son. 
They calmly sat together as another summer was spread over the fair land of Anjou, viewing from the safety of their siege camp how the Duke's men sneered less and less honestly from their walls with each passing day sans food. Reports arrived of how a rebellion in the Duchy of Flanders threatened to destroy France with far more likelihood than the encroachment of the Germans, but that summer, the Normandy family wasn't having any of it. They sat back, held out their cups into an endless flow of wines and ales, and waited for the godless Geoffrey to surrender his lands. Then, a familiar twist of fate reversed Robert's fortunes. The Pope, foolishly pitying the plight of the people of Anjou, had overturned his judgment of Geoffrey and ordered the Norman troops to cease practicing their violent ambitions against peoples who were, upon a costly further inspection, loyal to God. There was no end to the curses that Robert invoked for this injustice. That the king had stolen away his kingdom was one thing, but now an even higher and more untouchable power was stealing away even his meagre right to a more significant duchy. What was to be next? Would he receive a vision from God himself telling him that the chicken he'd been looking forward to for dinner had been carried away by ants to service some unknowable end? Such questions induced a sulk of royal proportions, subjecting the court of Le Mans to regular outbursts at the merest slight for the better part of a year. Finally, his bruised servants were relieved to hear that Duke William was taking Robert to the other side of Normandy to begin the next step in winning the command of the king. The Normans would end the French Civil War in the King's favour, and furthermore stop the chaos it was causing from spilling over into their ultimately indifferent domain. So the last of Robert's teenage life would pass on this long and underwhelming campaign, fighting only to please his father and his liege, the two guardians of his future crown. After all the effort he was putting in, there was no way he would let either of them get away without giving him all that he deserved. Duke William of Normandy must have taken pity on his poor son Robert. He must have seen him trudging around the camps of the French army, his armour pestering all with its constant rattling on account of the straps being too loosely fastened, and his face beset by a most unkingly scowl. Naively imagining that his boy's foul temperament was not permanent, he bestowed upon him a late birthday gift in January 1074. He declared war on the Count of Amiens, Raoul, in order to expand the Duchy of Normandy a little further. Victory was inevitable, so in effect, William was simply adding to Robert's inheritance. It was not the promise of one day ruling Amiens that really gave Robert satisfaction though, it was the humiliation of Count Raoul that he rose to a smirk over. Raoul had been long trusted to lead the armies of the French King Philip. Stealing his lands proved to all that it was House Normandy who were the foremost family in France, and brought Robert slightly closer to hooking puppet strings onto the King's right royal hands. This was the only goal he could pursue in life with any vigour, for it was the only chance for him to make his childhood dreams of becoming royalty himself a reality. Anything less, or anything else, was barely worth getting out of bed for, as Robert made very clear to all who attempted to enter his tent on a summer noon during the three years of campaigning he endured to restore the king's control over Flanders. One day though, the tent flap was pushed aside by a man the sight of whom compelled a burst of lacerated chicken to escape Robert's mouth and cover the silken pillows of his daybed. It was none other than his old master, Orderic, clutching in his hands a sealed leather quiver. Ten years after he had been cast out of Le Mans amid a tantrum of Robert the Boy, he returned to dangle a most intriguing document over Robert the Man. Orderic had succeeded in the greedy mission that his foolish boy ruler had once given. He was in possession of a letter signed by the King's Royal Council 
that bequeathed the county of Vendôme to the first-born son of William II of Normandy. The paper was fresh, yet the signatories were long since dead, and suitably venerated for the task of giving one last order. Robert wiped the grease from his hands on Orderic's cloak, grabbed the forged claim, and with a barely audible merci through his half-full mouth, he left his loyal chancellor and rushed for his horse. Now that the claim was his, he just needed someone to champion it for him. His father was delighted to indulge his heir, even with a claim as see-through as this one, and not just because of the residue of Robert's greasy fingers. The armies of Normandy were mobilized to attack the Duchy of Anjou, for the third time in William's rise to greatness. Robert marched back home with his 700 men, ready to waltz onto a victorious battlefield or into a luxurious siege camp. But something went wrong. The Duke of Anjou, Falk the Cruel, had raised some 2,000 men, and quickly abandoned his own lands in order to dodge the advance of the Norman main force and intercept the one responsible for this upheaval. Robert's men woke up one morning to a force of triple their number forming up for battle outside the camp. The men looked to Robert. Robert looked at the enemy. Then he looked in the other direction. Retreat! He led his men out of the camp in partial order, trying to look as calm and professional as they could. The Anjou forces waited patiently, wishing to allow their foe to form up properly before an easy yet honourably conducted battle. That would not be the way of it, for Robert lost his nerve and bolted with a few riders to get clear of the field. His men followed his example, and the Anjo force realized that they would have to get a move on to get their loot that day. Some of Robert's men were unable to get to safety. They were slowed by harassing cavalry, and ultimately engaged by charging infantry. Robert did not look back over his shoulder, and did not see a hundred or so of his troops killed amid the shambolic rout. Perhaps it would have been more if they did not happen upon the camp of Count Raoul, who had been made to lead the men who had stolen his lands in some cruel twist of fate orchestrated by William. Five thousand Normans peered over at the noisy arrival of Robert's retinue. Raoul was happy to upstage the heir to House Normandy, and sent his men out to save the rest of the main company. Robert left him to it, hurrying his men away in search of his father's troops in Vendôme, and insisting to any that asked that he had been there all along. Raoul must have been lying about the affair with the retreating and the begging for help, as a bitter old count in his position surely would. The story fit with one of Robert's earlier lies about being involved in a big battle over in Rem during the Civil War. That must be where he lost all those men. With the story laid straight, now Robert just needed to wait for his father's 8,000 strong host to finish the job. There was actually some fighting in Maine when the Angevins tried again to make an example of Robert's people, but Duke William stamped that out on Robert's behalf. Robert rode up to the battle several hours after it started and was allowed by William to have a go commanding the centre. He had glorious fun, ordering his overwhelming force to smash through the surviving enemy ranks, and partook of the noble sport of peasant jousting with his father. Their heartwarming laughter, just audible over the screams, would have made Duchess Matilda very happy were she there to see it, and not busy running the Norman court while the boys did their thing. Their thing was done, folk surrendered, and Robert was named Count of Vendôme. Fourteen years of hard work had finally got him something. The tiny county next door, a mere fifth the size of what he already owned. His father had given him another gift that, in retrospect, was found to be utterly insulting. The Norman army could easily conquer all of France, Robert reminded himself constantly. His father's generosity was surely just a ploy to stop him from rising to true greatness. Was it his royal marriage? Was it his rapport with the High King of France? 
was at his dazzling command of the tavern wenches with his bawdy tongue and keenly memorized rude poems? Perhaps all three. Suffice to say, when a delegation from the freshly usurped land of Vendôme came to visit their new leader, offering him a chance to sponsor a festival as a sign of his goodwill, he cast out those beggars with a rasping refusal. The people of Vendôme learned well Robert's leadership style. He offered the choice between leaving him alone or facing his arbitrary angry rulings. Like the people of Maine, the grumbling peasants of Vendôme did their best to manage on their own. Orderic, the man behind the recent upheaval, was soon rumoured to be dining with the nobles of Anjou proper, trusted again by Robert to orchestrate the further downfall of Duke Folk. Feeding the ambition of a jealous count was hard work, but Orderic would rather weave schemes than sit at his lord's spittled side in court. It was finally time to relax again, which for Robert meant a welcome change of bed and slightly better food. There was business aplenty to attend to in the realm, but Robert loathed to preside over the court, especially not in the morning, so most days the Hall of Le Mans was barred and empty. Unfortunately for him, not everyone knew of this unwelcoming arrangement. One afternoon, he had claimed the hall as his private domain for the carrying out of a most arduous noble duty, seeing that the amorous low-born courtiers had their fill of their betters. Before the day's work was done, a bold city mayor threw open the doors and strode into the hall. Robert coughed out a grape, shooed Madame Adeline away from his throne, and casually crossed his legs. With a raised, broken voice, he asked the mayor to remain in the doorway for the purposes of their conversation, some ten metres back and slightly below the height needed to truly confirm the state of affairs in and around the throne. The mayor briefly shouted his pitch about lower taxes in recently conquered and looted cities, and Robert nodded with remarkable enthusiasm. Of course the mayor would have his wish, if only he would close the door and his mouth. The next day, the nobles of Maine were shocked to see Robert had taken a sudden, deeply keen interest in this particular matter, and gladly accepted his proposal for an amendment to the law, if only to encourage the Count to bring more issues before them. They didn't see him again for a long time. Court was finally held properly a few months later apparently in order to discuss fulfilling a sweet nothing promise Robert had made to get Madame Adeline married into a noble family. Was this better than no government at all? The debate raged among the courtiers as Robert laughed and murmured to Adeline in the corner with his eyebrows scarcely lowering. Interrupting the futile course of affairs was the arrival of Orderic with a group of travelling knights. What business he had conducted with them was beyond Robert's care, but it was insisted that they be allowed to join the court and dine with them as guests. Robert waved his hand in response and left Orderic to interpret the signal as he wished. The knights stayed and competed with their local counterparts in a friendly combat tournament. Robert glanced at the proceedings a few times from his window, but his interest in fighting had dulled after spending years at war and discovering how truly boring real warfare was. In the evening, he took a stroll with Adeline into the grounds, indulging her endearingly annoying obsession with collecting fallen leaves to use in broths she would never make. Orderic intercepted them, walking with three companions, two of which held up the third by the arms. It was a hedge knight wounded in the tourney. Orderic requested that the knight be allowed to stay in the castle until his wounds were healed. Robert looked the burly knight up and down, looked at Adeline, who was definitely also looking the burly knight up and down, and finally produced a handful of coins from his pocket, poured them through the knight's open visor, and informed him that the next lord down the road was into his sort. A clammy slap on the knight's chestplate and a tight-lipped smile for Orderic concluded Robert's involvement in the affair. So life continued on in the pleasant counties of Maine and Vendôme. 
By spring the next year, Robert was even more vacant from his duties, often leaving the castle to go on long walks, while the meddling Adeline was allowed to conduct business in the Count's name. He had bitten off more than he could chew with her, he was starting to realize. One morning, he rode out from Lamar and did not return. At first, all assumed he was simply absconding from his duties for good, but in truth, he had met on the road a messenger from Rouen, who carried tidings most dire for House Normandy. Duke William had suddenly passed away by afflictions unknown. The military genius, who many had foreseen as a king, was gone. What was to become of House Normandy now? Robert knew the answer. It was to become his. With matters of mourning and honouring the achievements of William quickly seen to, Robert was bequeathed a new barony, the capital county of Rouen, and of course, the title of Duke of Normandy. It was not the title he had wanted to inherit from his father, but now that he finally had it, it felt undeniably good. So good that he was able to smile through the news that William's will had elevated his younger brother Richard to the rank of Count. Robert was now head of the house and the leading duke in all France. What was more, the Pope's recognition of William's claim to the throne of England was applicable to him as the direct heir of the claimant. He needed only to raise enough troops, and a just conquest of England would be his prerogative. And why use his own troops, good as they were, when the troops of his good friend the King were still alive and kicking? The scheme to secure control of the King would now enter its next phase. In the Grand Hall of the Norman capital, Rouen, the freshly titled Duke Robert II assembled his father's court to begin building a new order within the duchy. Unlike his court in Maine, the High Norman court was filled with the finest mines and sword arms the realm had to offer. Men and women of the most stately and talented breeds surrounded the young Duke, and in the light of their achievements and ambitions, his meagre flame was obscured. Yes, an able court was a dangerous thing for a ruler whose authority was mostly imagined, and indeed it was no exception here. The most powerful in Normandy disdained the new duke. From the brilliance of William, the man who wore his title of bastard with pride, for it only made his successes stand out more clearly, to the wilting boar Robert, not so proud as to not scream in court when his will was not fully attended to by any and all present. The officials of Normandy lamented their dire fortune. The most common complaint was that Robert held three counties in his own name, with the aptitude to manage merely one being well demonstrated to have left his bloodline at some point during conception. All demanded that Robert create new counts to manage his realm. He was eventually forced to agree to raise his youngest brother William to this rank, a shrewd insurance policy from the courtiers, for with that both of Robert's brothers had armies to their name, who might just nudge the rudder of history given the chance. Robert did not consider it that way. Instead, he delighted in giving William the county of Vendôme, so that it might be obvious to all that he, in his much larger county next door, was the bigger man. His rarely empty mouth had achieved a similar goal. After also promoting one of the leading Norman generals to the rank of Baron, people stopped bothering Robert so much about it, and he tuned out the background whining with practiced ease. In early 1081, there happened to be a war afoot for France, as King Philip saw fit to contest a Mediterranean island held by the Amerid Emirate. They weren't Catholic, so they were fair game. Most of the Norman nobility were eager to further their reputation as the foremost warriors in France, and camped under the King's banner along the coast, ready to sail off to glory. Robert wasn't the sort for sailing off to glory, though. He needed his men for when he decided to upstage his father and successfully conquer England, which he presumed would be possible once the rest of his duchy's men returned from their pointless escapade. 
Thus, he settled in for a quiet summer in French high society, enjoying the absence of all the more popular dukes. In May, a plan-ruining turn of fortune reared its familiar head. In response to the French king's threats, the Amerids had sent an army to raid France itself. Their first target? Normandy. The Norman army was still in the area, but General Raoul and King Philip both agreed that Robert could deal with this invasion, leaving the French invasion force to go pillage the presumably unguarded enemy realm. Somehow, as usual, Robert's plan had backfired with precision that could only be the work of the very same god who supposedly ordained the war in the first place. Robert's summer was thus spent visiting his vassals and asking them to contribute troops for his new task. His younger brothers were the least enthusiastic to help, and considering the groans and sighs of the other landowners, that's saying something. Fortunately, the Amerids were hopelessly lost in the strange land they had been sent to, and didn't wander far from Evreux where they had first landed. So, even though it took all summer to muster, Robert's army was able to meet the Amerids in battle before too much of the realm was discomfited by their foreign appearance. Not to mention their pillaging ways sufficient to shock even these descendants of Vikings. The battle was thankfully not conducted with Robert's supervision, meaning the old Duke's experienced officers could try some actual strategy. They used a tactic new to them but considered old hat a thousand years prior, an oblique order formation with most of the army clumped up on the left to guarantee victory on one flank. The French centre fled the battle quickly to avoid the strength of the more traditionally deep Amarid centre. This led said centre away from the flanks. The French left struck and the Amarid right was flattened by a force ten times its size. Then all the French needed to do was wheel around to attack their foe's main group from behind, and the battle was good as won. Around 800 Amerids were killed in the action, and while the rest escaped before nightfall, they were only running into the French countryside, a land in which they were heathens to be killed, or worse, without mercy by any they met. Robert was quick to report the victory to King Philip, who was most pleased with the Duke's very patriotic account of events. Robert learned that the French army in the Mediterranean was stuck making a boring siege. The glory and honour of victory in battle was so far entirely to be enjoyed by the Normans and by him. Knowing that another battle would be needed to finish the coalescing Amarid horde off, Robert decided to send away from the army all the companies belonging to his vassals. This ensured his personal army would strike the killing blow and receive the lion's share of the credit for winning this holy war. As usual, Robert was thinking only of his own position and advancement, but in truth, Sending the high morale troops of his angry vassals home gave his enemies in court great power. In fact, two powerful men approached William, the recently appointed Count of Vendôme, to begin convincing him that he should seize the duchy from Robert by force. The names of these men? Confusingly, Robert and William. But suffice to say, they were powerful men, with the latter being Duke Robert's military marshal, responsible for the training of soldiers. With these figures ready to stand against him if a banner was raised, Robert's position was extremely precarious. Robert's own men continued their march for glory, finding the Amorids again across the border in the Holy Roman Empire, and defeating them again with precisely the same strategy that had worked before. Perhaps it was the last thing their commander expected, if he was experienced in strategic matters. These troops then marched towards home, planning to stop at Paris to pay respects to the king and have their efforts lavishly rewarded with parades, prizes, and all manner of honours both spiritual and carnal. Instead, they found the city going about its business, with the news being that the war had ended some time ago after some deal was struck in a faraway palace. Turned out the Duke never did get around to sending that letter to his army to explain it all. 
he must have been distracted by the increasing alarm he felt when he reviewed again and again the report on just how many troops in his realm had pledged to support William if he wished to rebel. His eventual response to this threat was something that can only sit on the hinge between disastrous and genius. He made the ringleader of the plot against him, William of O, the spymaster of Normandy. It was like handing your worst enemy a sword and turning your back. What could he have been thinking? You must understand that Robert was no pragmatist. Killing William of O in secret would solve his issue. But there was a far more fascinating solution. The new spymaster was to be kept sufficiently busy that he could not effectively plot with his co-conspirators. The business he would conduct was the gathering of a band of men, told only that they were being hired for the purposes of killing a known traitor within the Norman court. Several men were happy to join the plot, eager to await Robert's indication of who their target was. Each bead of sweat on Spymaster William's head was another victory in Robert's brutal psychological campaign. Only William knew who the traitor was, but as Spymaster he could not flee, nor could he not carry out his liege's scheme to prepare the weapons and methods for his own murder. As it happened, Robert caught wind of another plot in his realm. Some scorned lover of one of his generals, Robert de Conteville, was planning the ultimate revenge. Spymaster William, so the tavern rumour said, was going to lead the general to the quiet spot where one Madame Avis would enact justice by dagger point. Wishing to preserve his retainer, Robert sent a snidely worded letter to William, informing him that the plot was to end at once, for now the Duke needed only to utter the secret phrase in court and point at the spymaster to have a band of willing executioners appear from the shadows. While William could have played along to prolong his life, it was clear to him that Robert intended simply to toy with his prey. He was fully enveloped in the Duke's trap, doomed to be dominated in any way the cackling man-child saw fit until the fun was exhausted and death was all that remained. The only recourse was to fight his way out. Surprising the whole realm, he declared publicly that not only would he continue his attempt to murder the enemy of the friendly girl who had given him such a nice time in the gardens that one night, but he was also going to kill the Duke of Normandy, for reasons he wished to remain private. It seemed that he had snapped, which was dire news for his 700 personal troops, now forced to fight the rest of the Norman army, numbering five times that. The manic spymaster had surprise on his side, but nothing else. He was beset from all corners by foes, and forced to watch as Norman slew Norman in the hidden name of his foolish scheming. His defeat would remove one of Robert's strongest political enemies from the equation, and cast him as a madman of the highest order. It was the sweetest victory that could have come from Robert's crafty manipulations. Master of the gloat, Robert held his royal wedding in ruin as the fighting continued. Mare Stenkel's daughter, sister to the reigning King of Sweden, joined the Duke, dressed as a king, beneath the beautiful stained glass of a holy cathedral. Their dazzling attire shone out to attract the eyes of all to their otherwise well-matchedly plain appearances. Robert's international fame was established, as guests from the high courts of neighbouring kingdoms arrived to witness the union, and hear the well-paid bards tales of Robert's valour and cunning. One visitor to the affair was none other than Robert de Conteville, the military leader whose womanising ways had stirred up the waters in precisely the way needed for Robert of Maine to reach safe port. The Duke introduced the general to his younger sister Agatha, and the pair were soon nowhere to be seen at the matrimonial festivities. That was not the end of that little tale, for a week later, Robert happened upon Agatha in the castle kitchen, sitting beside one Avis de Clare, the mastermind to the plot to kill de Conteville. 
it seemed that both of them had taken deep offence to the lies de Conteville had told them in order to elicit various services, and now they were equally set upon killing the man. Robert, eager to win the support of his sister in a family one waving banner away from total war, decided to join in on the murder party. After all, getting rid of that general was somewhat neat in the literally grand scheme of things. Alongside that project, he was keeping an eye on his army, which was starving out the last men loyal to William of O. Upon their success, William was presented to the Duke in chains, who had that traitor sent to rot in the dungeon. Could anything make this victory even better? Evidently, yes. At the same time, the King of France decided that Robert's enemy, Folk of Anjou, was sufficiently unpopular that the crown could probably steal the county of Tours without much resentment. Far from resentment, Robert felt only joy. He was happy to send his men to humiliate his neighbour, and of course he wanted to please his king as much as he could, for one good turn deserves another. Furthermore, if the king managed to scatter Folk's armies, perhaps Robert's long-term goal of annexing Anjou into Normandy would be realised. Robert was first into his armour now. Suddenly, war didn't seem so boring anymore. In October 1084, the army of King Philip of France crushed a smaller Angevin force in the county of Blois. It was the beginning of the king's conniving plan to steal away the county of Tours from Duke Folk of Anjou, his own vassal. Amid such a festival of power abuse, jealous rage and Angevin bashing, Robert of Normandy was quite at home. He was in Anjou proper, breaking open the walls and forts of the district with his late father's army. This would help his king none, but he was not there for the king. Perhaps the lowest Norman peasant would be impressed by their duke's loyalty to his liege, but Robert's true intentions were not exactly hidden. He campaigned through Anjou, and at each settlement he came across he would single out the leading citizens and make them an offer. Sign a letter begging him to take over as their duke, or see their homes raised in the name of the glorious and divinely inspired king of all France. Soon he had evidence that to deny the people of Anjou his leadership would be a far greater sin than to covet his neighbours' mules and more, for look at how so many were begging for his protection. With the Anjou forces destroyed by the king's successful campaign for Tor, all Robert needed to do was get a few mailed bodies out there with his banner and the county was as good as his. But there was one man who didn't believe the claims of the hastily sown compendium of beggary Robert flaunted. His name was Gillim, and by Robert's poor fortune, he ruled the prosperous duchy of Toulouse, a duchy with men and mind to stop the Norman toddler from snatching that which hung above his cradle. Another foul trick of fate this was. He had seen many hundreds of his men killed pacifying Anjou, and these olive-eating Toulousans would have there be no reward. It was in times like this that Robert would quickly run out of people to moan to, and end up moaning in a violent whisper to God. God, though, had taken far too many liberties of late, so Robert instead found that certain girls in certain parts of just about any town could be paid to listen to one moan all night. The poor coin consorts got more than they bargained for, but at least it lightened the Duke's mood. It taught him a very important life lesson too. Love can be bought. Duke Gillem awoke one morning to a visit from a belle of Rouen, sent rather out of her depth to present the Duke a fine platter of golden horse figures. Alas, he had a dozen of those already, but he was impressed all the same with Robert's taste in messengers, and goodwill was bought one way or another. Maybe Robert wasn't as unlikable as he came across at feasts, Gillam thought, but really such thawing did nothing to remove his obligation by marriage to uphold Folk's claim to Anjo. Robert, never having considered a single obligation to be beyond ignoring, tried a new angle. 
his court chancellor, Gerbo, successor to the happily retired Orderic of Maine, had proven himself a silver-tongued preacher of Robert's self-assessed virtue. The king had shown interest in the tales of Robert's slaying of a German lord with a mightily thrown spear, his pacification of a rebellious mob with an infectious, warm-hearted laugh, and there was even some play to be had for the tale of the stray Brezian manticore slain with only a sharpened chicken leg bone. It was all good dinnertime entertainment, if nothing else. Now this Chancellor arrived in Toulouse to put yet more bards out of work. Duke Gillam was impressed at the artistry of these Norman boasts. Usually people insisted on their own greatness in a far more obnoxious fashion. But was he willing to stain his honour by ignoring a call to arms? Absolutely, positively not. It was time to give up on the dream, and all could see it. Robert knew what to do. Clench the sword at his bedside, and dream harder! If there was to be a war between North and South, then he was going to win it. He would rally all the Norman lords, and gather a grand army that could deliver him victory. Most importantly of all, the army should contain as many troops as possible from the estates of his brothers, for if the war was to be hard fought, it should be the men of the pretenders who were given up to God. Richard had made some half-committal promise that he would send a force that included, curiously, twenty-four and a half archers, on account of one being for want of legs below the knee. Furious upon reading the letter, Robert threw his sword at a nearby chair, striking it in such a strange fashion that it flipped over and cast the weapon back the way it had come, bruising its master on the forehead. A few days later, Richard awoke to find a rather tired-looking Belle of Rouen, wielding a stained pillow covered in barely used golden model horses. It came with a closely themed promotion to Master of Horse in the Norman court, an ultimately meaningless but well-received gesture. With his brothers as good-spirited as they could be paid to be, it was time to begin Robert's first big boy military campaign. Any further delay would allow Duke Falk to recover his strength. As summer waned in the year 1086, the Norman army was assembled, come what may. Two years on from the last war, Anjou was in no shape to fight. Falk the Cruel had stitched together a small army of undesirables to ensure he was not said to be hopeless, but they were quickly defeated by the Norman host. However, as the Normans prepared to capture their quarry in Anjou, the promised Toulousan army was reported to be on the move, with numbers to match or even exceed their own. Duke Gillam had no particular interest in helping Falk, not even a grudge against keen-eyed Robert. He was there to show the rest of the kingdom that his realm was just as fit to be known as the strongest duchy as Normandy was. Hence, he marched not for the battlefields of Anjou, but for the Norman capital at Rouen. Robert, currently residing at said capital, and now on a bound to stay there, sent messengers of all natures to the army camp to secure the force's return. He heard nothing back, but in this case, no news was good news, for it meant that his commanders had wisely ignored the panicked orders of the man behind a thousand tons of stone walls. They marched east, for word was that the Toulousan rearguard was trailing the rest of the army after getting lost amid the landmarkless plains of the northern countryside, not helped by the fact that French armies were marching all over the place in preparation for another of the king's campaigns against the Muslim warlords of the south. Somewhere in the mix, the Normans chanced upon and consumed their foes, turning Blois into a battlefield once again. 400 Toulousans were killed, but the remainder had been tipped off as to the location of their compatriots by the Normans chanting about saving Rouen. They scurried north, with the Normans in pursuit, but they reached the siege camp of their main force without incident. That left the two armies camped next to each other, with the Lord of the Land screeching for help from the walls of Rouen Castle so piercingly that the Norman soldiers were humiliated into fighting the Toulousans, if only to eliminate the witnesses to the shameful display. The two sides formed up as if there was a great mirror between them. 
the armies were near identical, the ground was flat and the sun was high. Nothing looked stronger about one force or weaker about the other, and so things continued to be as the fighting commenced. Blow for blow, man for man, inch for inch they fought, their fates in lockstep, their troops withering amid their becalmed formations. The battle concluded with 500 dead on both sides, and little else achieved. Only the arrival of fresh men from Anjou persuaded the Normans to draw away, now slightly outnumbered and thoroughly depleted of strength. With the Toulousans feeling the same, the only thing chasing the Normans from the field was the great rasp of the man in the high tower. While it seemed that the Normans had been bested, Robert found another chance to invest in a change of fortune. A group of mercenaries, the Catalan Band, had apparently come ahead of the Toulousan force in preparation for just such a moment as this. After waiting for their potential clients to become desperate, they delighted in offering their Toulousan killing service, a service that was well practiced and came well recommended by Gillam's enemies in Occitania. Robert had the golden diadem left behind by his mother, late of a few months prior, smuggled from the castle, and with that he had 1800 men at his disposal so long as further golden objects followed suit. The united force of Normandy and Catalonia now took on the united force of Toulouse and Anjou, pressing their dearly bought advantage in battle and lifting the siege of Rouen. Finally, Robert's men could join him in a screech of victory. Most of the invading force was still alive, so the victorious allies pursued the Angevin banner south to Bourges, where an exhausted foe gave them little trouble in a second battle. The Toulousans, despite the loss of more than half their number, rallied not far from where they were broken and marched northwest back to Normandy. Such defiant courage went unnoticed, for the Normans were under orders from Robert to kill every last Angevin they saw, and the ones they saw had fled back towards Rouen in a blind panic. With something that smelled faintly of victory afoot, Robert was able to stop rummaging through the chests and shelves of his courtiers in search of more jewellery. His family's wealth reduced to a single wooden box of apparently unwanted golden horse models, he dismissed the Catalonians. His troops wintered in Rouen, but it was not a peaceful winter, for the wandering army of Toulouse returned to try their luck again. Alas, they were as long out of luck as they were out of food, and one in three did not stumble back from that venture in good health. Those that lived would see the Normans in battle again before this war was over. They returned to Anjou via an unsure route, arriving to find Robert's army was again waiting for them, amid the unchecked slaughter of the scant company still marching in the name of Falk. It would be a long time before another Toulousan was seen in Normandy after that. What remained now was the relatively peaceful part of the war, starving out Falk's last supporters, a year's work at least. Robert could finally breathe and stop poring over the maps and memorizing details of the soonest ship to depart for some far off land. Indeed, he felt like his fortunes must be improving, for his whole view of the world seemed to have changed. Was this what it meant to be a man of honor? No longer did he look out over his dining table and see the gilded bowls and silver chalices. He saw only his honest and hard-working family and court, glaring back at him with what could only be envy for his achievements. As you might have guessed, he actually was still seeing the world with the same dull-eyed clarity as before. His ambition had quickly cleared the table of its finery, just as it had the whole castle. In fact, the only shimmer of light one could see was the knife in his good sister's hand, clutched tightly as she asked again through weathered teeth what Robert had done with their late mother's precious golden diadem. Not believing the claim that a bird had stolen it, she shot up and raised the knife above her head with a growl that awoke the slumbering guards by the door. It was only a passing murderous rage, as it were, but its cause would not be forgotten. Indeed, as Robert sat back to wait for another victory to be delivered to him, forces were at play to ensure that nothing like this idiotic war ever happened again.
On a sun-drenched field outside the village of Sala, Duke Folk of Anjou found his company of loyal troops surrounded by the menace of the north, the army of Duke Robert. His court in Anjou was full of these Norman bullies already, as he was to witness personally. In chains, he was dragged into his own home, to the feet of the self-styled Saviour of Anjou. Not only could Robert claim to have defeated the Manticore of Brej, but now he had rid the locals of Folk the Cruel. Let the tyranny of House Anjou be cast away, and the… something else of House Normandy begin. With such words, Robert accepted Folk's sword point surrender, swept the coronet from the captive's head, and plopped it atop his own. With that simple motion, the Danjo dynasty was consumed. With enough gold, he could arrange for the Duchy of Anjou to be formally re-established as his own property, which would have the exciting consequence of making Robert a double duke. But money was short and selling the Anjou coronet would take away his new badge of office. No, coin would have to be saved for a far more furtive investment. Robert's eyes turned north, gazing across the choppy grey sea that separated him from his birthright. His father's legacy was to be squeezed to the last drop, and before Robert there was now an open door, held ajar by a grinning joker, for the English had thrown off the oppression of Norway. The Anglo-Saxons ruled again, kindly warming Robert's throne for him as he prepared the ultimate sales pitch. He needed the army of King Philip to stand a chance of clearing his plate of all England. Said King was already far along the road of being convinced thanks to the silky tales of valour brushed over the ears of the High Court by Gerbeau. The Normans had saved France from disaster countless times, it came to be believed, and it was even said that Robert had personally saved the life of the King by way of his role as the royal cupbearer, keenly dowsing out a poisoned wine that he almost certainly hadn't planted himself. Yet all this was distastefully coloured by the jokes of Frankish nobles regarding the unsophisticated accents of the Normandy region, and, more worryingly, their connection to those brutish Germans and Norse folk that were thought to be plotting against the civilised peoples of France even still. It was a fear cajoled by those whom the fear benefited, with little real basis, for in fact Normans and Franks were near identical in their practices, language and ambition. The similarity was such that Robert could begin to call himself French with no work whatsoever, his favourite amount. So he did, claiming to the French High Court that in order to further unify the realm of his esteemed king, he would no longer recognise the distinction of Norman from the other Frankish groups. To fight for Normandy was to fight for all France, he insisted. This ploy is thought to have impressed the French court as Robert had hoped. However, the usual disregard for the views of his subjects now returned to mire his bold strides, as it always did. Opening the grand door into the hall of Rouen Castle, any applause for his progressive attack on social divides was drowned out by the cries, screams, shouts and general clattering of overturned tables all originating from some very angry Normans. Apparently, to betray the heritage of all the noble families in the duchy and side with those who had always looked down their noses upon Norman kind was not a very popular move. Robert tried to explain that it was a ruse aimed at using Frankish power to further Norman ambitions. Perhaps in the calm quiet of a walk through the gardens, the point would have landed but amid the bustle of this finely dressed rabble, the point was torn up, corrupted and regurgitated into a barrage of accusations. Robert was lying so freely about a matter that close to heart? What else was a lie? His father would have trusted in Norman's strength alone, and given no debt to the sneering Franks of Paris. While they were at it, complaints high and low were thrown out to fry in each other's juices, bringing long-heated issues to the boil. Finally, the chaos was brought under control by the arrival of Robert's military marshal, William of Evreux. 
Each clanking step he took was echoed by his sword, loosely gripped in the sheath it was already partially drawn from. A man of military mind would surely see things Robert's way. The Duke stood from the throne he had cowered on and opened his arms to welcome William. William stopped short of the stubby embrace and cleared his throat. He declared that he, William of Evreux, would fight to see the rightful Duke of Normandy, William of Vendôme, installed on the moist throne before them. Oh dear. The other nobles, would be Duke William included, started gathering around the marshal. Oh dear. Landowners started pledging to serve the duo of Williams in this cause, amounting to several thousand men's worth of levy being set against Robert's war-weary counties. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. After the list of indictments was concluded, Marshal William looked to the Duke for an answer to his request. Robert slowly removed his father's golden headpiece, placed it on the slippery wood of the throne, and shuffled into the dark corners of the hall behind him, where a small door gave him exit to the stairs below his chamber. Throughout, his face was smiling, his movements careful and deliberate, and the crowd silent. As soon as the door clanked shut, a cheer arose in the hall, and Robert sprinted up the stairs in a display of fitness unknown to his story so far, and tragically witnessed by none. Plenty witnessed the displays he put on in the days and weeks to come, though. Maids heard him bawling in his room. Guards encountered him slashing at moonlit sacks of hay in the quad. And the court of Normandy saw him playing dead at the opposite end of the table from Duke William. Robert still had to be there, for he was still Count of Maine, Rouen and Anjou, making him the most powerful man in the duchy. For now, a snivelling corpse, hanging on to claims that he was French now anyway so didn't have to listen to William, would stand in for this prestigious Arc Count. Recovering from this drawn-out episode would take the better part of the year 1090. Robert's young Swedish wife bowed out of her futile attempts to comfort her husband, disappearing off to seek God in a nunnery, and leaving Robert to be comforted more successfully by his old girlfriend, Adeline, the peasant regent of Rouen. In May, Robert received a visit from his brother, Richard. Richard's gullibility had made him fond of the legendary Robert of Maine, and now he had a strong reason to make peace with the real one. William was the youngest of the Normandy brothers, and so in elevating him to Duke, the nobles had passed over the more legitimate choice of Richard. The two elder siblings realised they were of one mind when it came to little William. He had to be punished, and the position of Duke needed to be made vacant once again. So it was that Robert bonded with an estranged sibling over a murder plot targeting another estranged sibling. It was simply that sort of family. It will come as no surprise then that it was also the sort of family where all the happy overtones of kin slaying were laced with deceit. Robert discovered that Richard was beginning to rally nobles to support him for a direct usurpation, just as William had done. The race was on. The barons of the land opened their doors one day to the dashing figure of Richard with all his heraldic regalia, speaking of the glories he would win for Normandy if only the scrawny William was retired to a more suitable role. The next day it was Robert, stains on his tunic and salt in his fingernails, banging tables, saying the word mine a lot, and asking to take a nap in their bed. Neither tactic worked, as it happened, for the nobles of the land currently had a ruler who wasn't levying half their tenants for years on end, which was ultimately the catch at the bottom of both elder brothers' manifestos. It came to be midway through 1091, and still no one had got bored of Duke William's peaceful ways. Robert, though, had fully recovered from the lows of the previous year, and in fact could be said to have rebounded in a spectacular fashion. For suddenly he was the one standing before the Duke in his best power pose, demanding that his titles be returned to him. If William refused, it would mean war, 
a war as difficult to win as the one Robert shied away from the January before last, and William did refuse. Shocked that Robert was seriously doing this, the duchy slipped into civil war. By this time, Robert had passed Anjou off to an old general, so he had only men from Maine and Rouen to fight with. William had the men of Vendôme, a thousand in total, who quickly marched to engage the 500 in Maine. There were also troops contributed by the Norman vassals, but luckily for Robert, these were few. The fact that no one really wanted to fight was working in Robert's favour. A couple of hundred men gambled on joining his 700 men from Rouen, and suddenly William had a real contest on his hands. Two small battles took place in Maine and Evreux respectively, with both playing almost exactly the same but with the roles reversed, one win for Robert and one for William. Then, all the Norman loyalists converged on Evreux for the decisive engagement. They had a solid advantage in numbers, and were led by veteran Norman commanders, including the man who knew the land best of all, William of Evreux. Robert's men were in trouble, so obviously that no one wanted to take command of the army, save for Robert, and no one wanted that either. In the hour of need, a horseman approached the camp in blackened garb, his face hidden by a hood. The troops recoiled at the sight. Was this the legendary spectre of death, seen only when one's life was at its end? There was no scythe, and besides, it was heading straight for Robert's tent, so maybe it was just a personal visit. It was, in a way, but not by the spirit of death. It was Orderic, the man who had guided Robert as a troublesome teen, and the man who had stained his honour to get Robert Vendôme, the very land now standing opposed to him. That evening he appeared once more to serve his old ward like a guardian spirit. He also brought a rare cheese, into which Robert tucked with unbridled enthusiasm before the nostalgic gaze of the old master. Orderic promised to rescue Robert from the dire straits he had sailed, and after sufficient badgering, also promised to reveal where the cheese was made for future reference. The tutor was given full command of Robert's 900 troops, which he took to a river near Lisieux. There, the loyalists had to make an awkward crossing into his prepared lines, about which they were none too pleased. In fact, William's right flank decided that traipsing through weed-filled water while arrows rained upon them was not worth the effort. They called off their attack as soon as it had begun. The odds were evened. Extra troops could be stationed on the banks in front of Marshal William, whose zeal drove his men all the way across and into a bloody melee. Waterlogged gear, an exposed flank, and the broken promise that the rebels would simply flee brought the loyalist offensive to a standstill. They lost two men for every rebel they slew in a muddy uphill battle, and in this fashion their will to fight was expended. Robert's rebels had avoided destruction, but more importantly they had shown the duchy that Robert had a chance to actually follow through on his childish claims. Both sides had about equal numbers, and both armies were gathering near the traditional battlefield of Blois for a formal pitched engagement. Without much delay, the contest began. The rebels, now led by Commander Raoul from Maine, focused much of their strength on their flanks, while Marshal William concentrated his men in his centre. The two formations were each other's mutual weakness, which meant when the lines clashed, it was a slaughter. Robert's centre broke under the weight of William's charge, but both of William's flanks were pushed off the field entirely. The effort of doing this shattered the rebel right, leaving only two groups of 400 or so men on the field, one under Orderic, the other under Marshal William. William was considered a mighty commander, leading from the front and fighting side by side with his troops to inspire from them great deeds. Orderic was not known for his machismo, but more for his craft. What hope did he have to win? Well, there is craft to be had in battle also. He kept his men in neat order, contrasting the mixed blob of a formation that William's men had ended up in during the fighting. The sight was unnerving to the loyalists. 
How was this band of rebels so disciplined? Furthermore, how were they advancing right towards them without rest? Orderic had a good eye. Not only had he determined that a box beats a blob of equal strength in the minds of men, but he determined the exact angle and timing required from his archers to hit the loyalists with a volley of arrows just seconds before his infantry delivered a charge. With tight coordination, he unleashed the missiles at a high angle. The arrival of the arrows made William's men raise their shields up over their heads, before moments later a wall of spears, axes, halberds and swords dug into their fronts. Two in ten loyalists were dead twenty seconds into the fighting. The rest did not stay to see how things would continue from such a beginning. Robert and company followed the fleeing loyalists north to Amiens, where another short battle was won. It seemed that Robert had truly proven himself as the rightful ruler of Normandy. The King of France was positively enamoured with the drama, casting away his doubts about the unjustly unpopular Norman convert. But remember, this is the ill-fated Robert of Maine we're talking about, member of the conniving Normandy dynasty. There was no way things could end so well, and indeed they didn't. With the Loyalist force destroyed, along with half of Robert's men, Richard rose up to stake his claim to the duchy. He had 2,000 fresh troops, already positioned in key areas for his usurpation. He was more popular than Robert, and more legitimate than William. In the high towers of Paris, they heard a ghostly scream in the night. A curse had been wrought upon a lost soul, to be sure. But at that moment, before the abyss, Robert would be gifted a way to make everything right again. <laughs>